uh, tell you one more time that going to this website right here, Dr. Paul Williams, if you like to make in your little uh, Aquaterra column, there are so many more things that you can make here at www.bottlebiology. Dr. Williams is a scientist that I uh, got to work with from the University of Wisconsin, and he's a botanist who spent his whole life studying plants and also getting kids excited about science. So I guess he's one of my science heroes, and he's got good stuff. You should check it out. All right, so the lesson we did yesterday was we created a model, and our model is the Aqua Terra column, and it looks like this. And it has an aquarium at the bottom and a terrarium at top. It has both living and non-living things in it, called living is biotic and non-living is abiotic. So we're going to use this model to learn about ecosystems. And this goes perfectly with chapter 8 in your science book, which is the <clears throat> Interactive Science by Pearson. We're going to be using your book, using your model, and using your brain to learn about ecosystems. This chapter is uh, all about how animals live in ecosystems, and there's quite a bit to learn. You're going to learn about organisms and uh, how organisms come together and form populations and how populations come together to form ecosystems. An ecosystem is all the living and non-living things that interact in an area. And there's some pretty cool things to learn about in here. You're going to learn about species. A species is one type of an organism. And you're going to learn about communities, how they interact and live together. I guess the, um, um, uh, we can do that by taking a look at our Aquaterra column. In your column, you have an aquarium with some invertebrates, which are the snails, and some vertebrates, which are the goldfish. You have plants. And you have a terrarium that also has plants in it, and hopefully some microbes and decomposers. And so everything we do today, I want us to be able to refer back to our Aquaterra column to see if it can help us learn some of these pretty cool concepts. So <clears throat> we talked a little bit about what are the living and non-living things in our ecosystem. And so things like sunlight and air and temperature. Those are all non-living things. Um, oxygen, even though we need oxygen, it's non-living. So in, in our ecosystem, it has water, non-living. It has oxygen in there, non-living. The temperature will affect it. The, the uh, soil consists of rock fragments and nutrients and decaying remains, but um, there might be living things in the soil, in parts of the soil, were biotic or living materials, but the sand and the gravel is definitely not. So the, the, the abiotic are these factors that are not living. The biotic are the living things, and we have mosses and leaves and, and fish and, and uh, plants and snails. And I also, unfortunately, I had a fish die last night, and instead of just throwing this fish into, instead of just throwing this fish uh, into the um, trash, I can kind of smell right now, I get some odor from it that it's, it's starting to decay. What I'm smelling is ammonia. Instead of just throwing that in the trash, I have a better use for this uh, fish. And here's what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to put this fish that's starting to smell right now in my terrarium. And I'm going to bury it. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I want that energy to go from the dead fish into the plants and the nutrients in my ecosystem here. So I'm going to take and make a little hole in here for it. And I might put this on the side so everybody can still see it when I put the dead fish down in there. So it's going to go right in here. There's my dead fish. I'm going to, push, I'm going to put the dirt back on top of it. But I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to cover it with dirt so it has a chance to start to decompose. And I might just leave it in there and see what happens. I have some, um, some of the water from it and won't hurt it a little bit. Here we go. 
And there's also another leaf uh, I'm going to drop in here to kind of cover it up. And that should provide quite a bit of, uh, of nutrients for my ecosystem. So I'm going to put that back in here. And it's going to be real interesting to see now what happens with um, the dead fish decaying back in my ecosystem. Now, you might wonder to think that's kind of, kind of gross to do that, but I'll tell you, I have a reason for that, and I'll show you what I mean. Let's just make a little drawing right here. Okay, we have a dead fish, and my, my fish is, uh, you know, he's seen better days. He's dead, and he's kind of uh, bad shape. Okay, <clears throat> instead of me just throwing this fish in the trash, that fish has a lot of energy in it. And it starts way over here. It starts with the sun, which is we call soul. And the sun, you might wonder, well, what, what in the world does that have to do with this dead fish? Well, the energy from the sun, both in visible light and infrared and a whole spectrum of energy comes down on the earth and when it hits water and land plants grow and these plants grow through a process called photosynthesis which you'll learn about photosynthesis and these plants they're green so the green plants are what we call producers in fact a farmer makes produce a plant is the first way energy is transferred. So energy comes from the sun to plants, trees, all kinds, of anything that's green. Now, if it happens to be in water, small little infusoria and insects and aquatic animals eat the plants. They become, become consumers. These consumers the energy flows from producers to consumers. Small fish eat both the plants and the consumers. So now we have going to second consumers because they eat an animal that eats the small things that eat the plants. Now, when a fish dies, it already has energy in it. It has energy in it from the sun to the plants to the small aquatic insects to the smaller fish until finally the energy goes up here. So if I just throw this fish away, I lose all that energy that was there. So instead of doing that, at my house, I have a worm farm in my basement. And this worm farm has been going on for about 20 years and it's filled with worms. And so what I do at home is I put that dead fish in my worm farm. All right, kind of cool. This worm farm, which has been going for 20 years, has three types of decomposers, red worms, little white nematodes, and some things I don't even know what they are. They're quite small. What happens is these worms get quite big. And when they get big, they're segmented. I take the worms, the energy from the worm, and I feed it to my fish, back to the fish. And this energy cycle, this cycle of energy, goes round and round and round. Now, if you understand that, you understand a lot about ecosystems, and you can see the world a little bit different. Let me show you what it looks like in your book. There's a section called What Happens During Photosynthesis. It talks about capturing the sun's energy. And there's a pretty cool diagram right here that shows sunlight hitting green plants, then a cell of a green plant, and then inside that cell is this little bitty green thing right here called a chlorosplat. Chloro means light green. It's part of chlorophyll. See this little guy right here? If you enlarge that, it shows you how Green plants use light energy and water 
to give off energy and oxygen. So in comes sunlight and water, and out goes oxygen and hydrogen, which is in the form of energy. So that's pretty cool. That's really cool. Because of that, because of that, animals can take in oxygen and eat those producers, the plants, and become consumers. And we also give off carbon dioxide, and that's something that plants need in order for the photosynthesis to occur. So on our next page in our book, uh, here is the photosynthesis equation. It talks about how in photosynthesis, which means photo means light, synthesis means to make, this leads to the production of glucose. So you have light energy plus carbon dioxide plus water equals glucose and oxygen, and the oxygen is given off. Now, you'll learn more about, so this is six molecules of CO2 plus six molecules of water. You end up getting glucose, which is C6H12O6 plus six molecules of oxygen. It's pretty cool stuff. This is something that every sixth grader should know about and should uh, uh, be able to understand. It's because of that that green plants can make energy and give off oxygen. It makes our planet unique in all the planets we've ever seen. This ability for a green plant to give off oxygen and make sugar. So getting back to my dead fish, there's two other places at my house that I do with the dead fish. For example, um, I have some potted plants, some orchids and some things in my basement and if a fish dies, if I'm, I don't put it in my worm farm, I'll take that one fish and I'll put it down inside of a plant. And that gives a lot of nutrients for my plant. And then this summer, I had a garden out back and with tomatoes and beans and, uh, and some corn. And we took lots of tomatoes out of the garden, lots of produce producers out of the garden. And I started thinking, you know, every time I take something out of the garden, I'm taking nutrients out of the dirt because all that food came from sunlight and nutrients and water that was added. So I thought, you know, I need to put stuff back in that dirt. If I don't put something back in the dirt every year, I'll have less and less nutrients in my soil. So when I had some fish die this summer, I went out to my garden and I buried them in my garden and I know that I'm gonna have some really good tomatoes next time because I'm keeping that energy cycle going. And you need to look at the energy in your aqua terra column. And I think the first thing you need to understand is how are we gonna keep those green plants healthy? What will they need? And the answer is they'll need sunlight. And you're gonna to have to find the right temperature. Sunlight and cold, dead plants. Sunlight and hot, hot, dead fish. So you're gonna to have to find the right abiotic temperature for your ecosystem. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about organisms. In your book, there's a pretty cool thing that, that it talks about how an ecosystem has living things, starting with organisms. Let me show you what I mean in your book. Ecological is a word like ecosystem, it has a, an organization. It starts, and this is a, the black-tailed uh, prairie dog. I've been out to South Dakota, and in one of my shows, uh, my fossil show, uh, on season uh, two, I believe, or maybe season one on Indiana Expeditions, we filmed some of these. But one, when you look, think about one, that's called an organism, one living thing. It's a certain species. It's unique. If that's a black-tailed prairie dog, it's a special organism that's only like that. When you get them living together, that's called a population. And they're all the same prairie dogs. Now, a population is not just prairie dogs. There's other animals that live with them and interact. In this case, there's a badger and there's a prairie chicken and the prairie dogs and there's also um, a lot of other things, the plants that live there, and that's called a community. Now, you put all those together, both the living and non-living things and how they interact, both the living and non-living thing, the dirt, the soil, the rattlesnakes, the prairie rattlesnakes, the bison, and you call that an ecosystem. So you see how an ecosystem is made up of a community of animals, which are different species, a population of certain species, and the population is populated by an organism. 
And so it goes from organism, population, community, ecosystem. And so I want you to look at your Aquaterra column and see if you can identify the organisms, the populations, the community that make up the entire ecosystem. So animals live together, uh, almost like sixth graders work together. And sometimes uh, um, you guys work together well and sometimes you don't. Animals are just like that. And those interactions between two animals, even of the same species or different species, we can divide into three types, all right? The first type is when two animal species interact and one of them gets a benefit and the other one doesn't. It's called communalism. Now, for example, a bird builds its nest in a tree. The, tr the, the bird gets a nice place, a habitat, in order to build its nest, but the tree gets nothing. There's, there's no benefit, but it doesn't hurt the tree. So when two animals interact and one gets a benefit, the bird getting the nest, and the other is not harmed, the tree, that's called that's called communalism. Now, sometimes two animals interact in a different way, where they both get something. For that's called mutualism. Mutualism is it's mutual beneficial. Mutual means both of them get something. For example, uh, when I lived in Africa, there's a type of ox, a wild ox, that lives out in the uh, in in Kenya in the savannas. And it's a big ox, but it gets these parasites, these bugs that live on it. There's a bird called the oxpecker that lands on it like a woodpecker, and it eats those bugs in the ears and all around this animal. Now, those two animals are interacting in a mutual way. It's called mutualism. Because, ask yourself, what does the bird get? It gets the dinner. It eats the bugs. Ask yourself, what does the ox get? The ox gets free of parasites, free of bugs that are sucking its blood. So both of those two animals interact in a good way, and that's called mutualism. Now the third way, I just did a show on it uh, the other day on uh, creepy crawly creatures, and a mosquito and a person. That's an example of a parasitic or a parasite. That's where one animal or one organism gets something from another that actually hurts the other animal. When a mosquito bites you, she is getting a blood bath, a blood meal, so she can uh, incubate her eggs. And when she bites you, the first thing she does as she sticks you with her long uh, pointed uh, face is she spits a small amount of anticoagulant saliva into your body. When she spits that into your body, in that saliva, there are organisms that can hurt you, like, for example, malaria or a lot of other diseases that are carried, encephalitis and different things that are carried in the spit of a mosquito. Yeah, a spit of a mosquito is not very big, but these microbes are not very big either. Think about their ecosystem. They live in the saliva of a mosquito waiting to get into a host a host would be you and I, and the carrier would be the mosquito. So really, it's not the mosquito that hurts us, it's the microbes that live in her saliva, or her spit. That's an example of a parasite and a host. And there's lots of those. Lots of uh, creatures live off of other creatures. So the three ways that you can learn about it in your book are communalism, mutualism, and parasitic. And that's pretty cool. So when you look at your ecosystem, you might think about that and see if one of those three ways are going on inside of your ecosystem. Now we talked a little bit about population. Like you shouldn't put more than one fish in these aquarium because it cannot support such a large population. That has to do with space and habitat. If you had a bigger aquarium, you could put more fish in it. Okay? So your book has a lot of amazing parts in it, and there's one more thing I want to show you in your book before we start our worksheet. All right, we have a lesson in your, in your chapter 8 that talks about how energy flows through an ecosystem. And I've added something. When you get to this part, you may want to add this also, because often they, they leave out one important part right here. I wrote the word sun, because the sun 
causes the plants to grow. A grasshopper will eat the plants, and the energy from the sun goes to the plants. The energy from the plants goes to the grasshopper. The energy from the grasshopper is eaten by a fox. This is called a food chain. These are all links in the food chain. Here, your ecosystem, sunlight, what plants, what eat the plants, what, you know, see if you can find the food chain in your ecosystem. So a fox might eat many things. And so let's take a look on the next page here. When, when you start looking at all the things in, in an ecosystem that a fox might eat, we call this a food web. And it starts here again with the sun. I'm going to write the sun in here because they didn't. All right, so it starts with the sun sending energy to plants. And we also have these mushrooms, these decomposers, decomposers. And just like my worms at my house, mushrooms are decomposers. When you see a mushroom, that's the fruit. A mushroom is actually the fruit or the, uh, the, 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 way, the, re the mechanism for reproduction of the rest of the organism that lives underground. So we have decomposers, sun, causing plants to grow. Crawdads, snails, grasshoppers eat plants. Shrews, birds, snakes, frogs eat all these things. The energy keeps going up to a fox. And so this is a food web because of all the different connections. We have decomposers, we have producers that produce energy from the sun. We have the first level consumers. Then we have the things that eat consumers. Those are second level consumers. Now, sometimes a second level consumer will also be a first level consumer, like this little shrew might eat grass. If it eats grass, it drops down to a first level consumer. When it's eating a snail or a grasshopper, it's a second level consumer. And finally, we have the fox that eats all of these. How do you fit into a food chain or a food web? Well, we're pretty much at the top. And uh, I don't, there's nothing that I know of, unless you're in Africa and being eaten by a lion <laughs> or, uh, or a tiger or in the mountains eaten by a, a bear, we are pretty much at the food, top of the food web and the food chain. So we've had, there's, a, um, there's a lot of stuff to do in here. Uh, I showed this last picture yesterday to, to another lesson I'm doing on owl pellets and how, once again, the sun, producers, consumers, second level consumers, and third level, how an owl is at the top of the energy pyramid. And this is showing you all the energy that goes up. So when an owl eats a snake or one of these mice, that owl represents a lot of energy. Let's take a look at our worksheet. And on the bottom of the worksheet, there are some questions that you should be able to answer all these questions and more. In fact, I left off one question you might want to write right here. And the question is, can you describe producers and consumers? in the system. Okay, you might want to add that one. Can you describe producers and consumers in the system? There's one more thing we're going to do before you start. It has to do with what are the basic needs of a living organism? And I'm going to go through some of the basic needs that I know of. And these basic needs, uh, we're going to talk about them in general the basic needs in general, but you'll need to look at your ecosystem, your Aquaterra column, and see if you can pick one organism in there and tell about the basic needs. Let's start with the one that you need the most, and that has to do with all living things need air. Okay, they need air. You would not live, you would not live more than five minutes without air. Now, but air is a mixture of both nitrogen and oxygen and CO2. And the very cool thing about that is that animals need oxygen and plants need carbon dioxide. So it's like when you have an animal here, an animal gives off carbon dioxide, but it needs oxygen. And when you have a plant, 
a plant needs carbon dioxide and gives off oxygen. And that's, that's, a, that's kind of a very cool thing. It's almost a miracle that things live like this. So air is a basic need for all living things. Next, water. Without water, you can probably live maybe a week uh, before you start getting sick, maybe a little bit longer, but all living things need water. Some can go longer, some less. Humans, we can do without some things, not air, but water is the next most important thing. Water makes our planet special of all the planets we've seen because we have a lot of water, but most of it we can't even drink. Probably, and you can check this, over 90% of the water is salt water or it's in, uh, and a lot of it's frozen in ice. We only have a, a small percentage of the water on this planet that we can drink. And that makes it even more important to keep it clean and filtered. Because without water, living things don't live long. In fact, I've been told that a human body is about 70% or more of water. You take all the water out of us and we're just a small pile of bones and solid materials. So water is very important. Next, after water, is food. In order to live or thrive, animals need food. The food cycle or energy cycle starts with the sun, producers, consumers, second level consumers, third level consumers. But for your ecosystem, you gotta ask, is it closed or open? Are you adding things to it? If you are, then it's an open system. You can add some food today. Here's rule number one. Don't overfeed. You have some flake food. I would put one or two flakes of food and see if the fish, the vertebrate fish, eats that food in a couple minutes. Any food that's left over will sink to the bottom and maybe the snail will eat it, but don't overfeed. Only what they can eat in like two minutes. You can try that in the morning. If they eat that, try it in the afternoon. A healthy fish is somewhat a fish that's almost always wanting to eat but not overeat. So rule number one, don't overfeed. Rule number two, don't overfeed. If you dump more fish food in there, whatever's not eaten sinks to the bottom. And there are microbes you can't see. But it's like down rains all these flakes of food. Around the gravel and in the water are a ecosystem, a colony, or I guess I better I should say a population of microbes. When that food comes, they go crazy. It's like, look at all this food. And they start multiplying and growing and multiplying and growing. And when they uh, consume those flake food, they do two things. They take oxygen out of the water and they give off waste in the form of different gases that can harm your fish. So very quickly, your aquarium turns into a toxic, no oxygen, filled with ammonia and different uh, uh, nitrites, nitrates and, and it really is not good for them. So rule number two, don't overfeed. Rule number three, uh, let me explain rule number three. Let's say you got up this morning and instead of going down to the breakfast table, you went and filled the bathtub and you got in the bathtub and your mom and dad brought you breakfast and they dumped it in the water. If you were quick, you'd eat some before it got too bad. And you sat in that bathtub all day. At lunchtime, they brought your lunch and they dumped that in the water. It'd be kind of gross. And you stayed there all day. And then in the, at supper, they came and they brought your dinner and dumped that in the water. Yeah, you get the picture and you slept in it that night and you, the next morning you woke up and it started all over again. That's why rule number three is don't overfeed. It will turn the habitat or the ecosystem into a poison trap. So those are the three rules. See if you can remember them. Next, all living creatures need a habitat that gives them both space and the right temperature. These are kind of like the right abiotic factors. Only one goldfish can live in this aquarium. It needs more space. The temperature, all living things have a temperature plus or minus that we live in. If it gets below 30 some degrees, we freeze to death. If it gets above 110 degrees, we burn up. 
And so all living things, and that's what you need to know about, you can learn about what are the best basic needs of the temperature and the water and the habitat for living things. The last thing that all living things need are other, other organisms that are the same. What I mean by that is that you need male and female for a population to thrive. So you, for the population to thrive, you need a male and a female. So we have air, water, food, habitat, and other organisms. Somebody's asked me, is that a boy fish or a girl fish? Will it have babies? Well, first of all, it's a juvenile. It will need to grow up. In order for that population to thrive, you will need a male and a female. And even then, it may not be enough. If you get a chance, if you ever go to the Cincinnati Zoo, there is a cage, uh, a, a display of the last two passenger pigeons that ever lived on this planet. See, passenger pigeons were these beautiful small birds, like a pigeon, and they had beautiful feathers. And for some reason, they were so pretty that it was, well, it was their undoing. Women loved to have them on their coats and on their hats, and so they were hunted. And they were hunted more and more, and they were easy to hunt. They were together in flocks. And they kept killing them and selling them, and people kept buying them. They even invented a gun called, I think it was a bunder bluster, that could shoot a hundred of them at once. Well, what happened was, that species, because they were becoming threatened, uh, their habitat was changing and people were killing them, they became threatened, then they became endangered, and finally, there was only a few left, and there were not enough left for the population to continue, so they became extinct. So a species can be a healthy population, threatened, endangered, and extinct. So if you ever want to see an extinct animal, you can go to the Cincinnati Zoo. Extinction, though, is a natural part of the world. When the earth is always changing, habitat changes, biomes change, ecosystems change, and things go extinct. That's natural. It only is a problem when it's caused by us, by people. So these are some of the things that uh, I want you to investigate. And we haven't had a chance much to talk about. One of my favorite is the decomposers. You remember my worm farm and those worms? You may want to find some worms to put in your terrarium or even some of those little isopod roly-polies and make sure you keep water on the top of your terrarium also because decomposers do a very important job. Without decomposers, you would not be able to go outside today. Think about that. The field next to your school and the back uh, area, every goose, if, if we didn't have decomposers, every goose, every piece of grass, every tree, every bush, every bird, every cricket, every hawk, every owl, every moose, every great, great, great grandparent Native American that ever lived and they died, if their bones and bodies were still there, it'd be stacked hundreds of feet tall. Because all that stuff, if it just stayed there, you couldn't go outside. To, to come to school, you'd have to have a bulldozer in front of your bus to push all the dead stuff away. Luckily, we have billions of decomposers that turn dead things back into usable nutrients that we can use. This is your ecosystem. You have your book, you have your assignment, and you have a model to learn by. I hope you learn a lot about the natural world around us. I'll see you next time. Uh, a couple of students brought in their Aquaterra column to show us here, and let's take a look at these. Okay, so here you have the, uh, the terrarium part, and in the terrarium you have, your, I see your bean seed there. So you hopefully that bean seed will grow, and you have soil, you also have some gravel and sand, and I really like that wick that goes down in there. Oh, and there's one of your invertebrates. An, inverte uh, an invertebrate is a little snail. Where's your snail at? Uh, down at the bottom there. An invertebrate, there, there is our invertebrate. An invertebrate is a snail because it does not have a backbone. And um, it's moving. If you tell, take a look at that, it's actually moving very slow. It's called a gastropod, which means stomach on foot. And it's moving. That's pretty cool. Check it out. You see it there moving? Now, it takes chemicals out of the water.
to build its shell. And it's moving pretty good. It's got its uh, sensors out like little spike eye stalks. And it's pulling itself. That's pretty cool. Check it out. That's a great one you got moving right there. And it's going across that piece of gravel, scraping with its tongue any kinds of food it can find. I got to say, that's a pretty cool invertebrate. Here's some of our hornwort plants. And the hornwort, as it goes up, maybe we have our, our vertebrate animal is doing pretty good in there. Let's see. There he is. So nice, uh, uh, a nice example of both plants and animals. Here's another one right here. What do we got? Oh, now this one is interesting. In this population, we have two. Now, I'm not sure how that's going <laughs> to, how we're going to do because it's a pretty small habitat. But uh, we'll see what happens when we have two goldfish in one. See how their mouths are opening and closing and, and they are uh, breathing a lot trying to get oxygen in. It really might be better to move that one of those out of there. It, you know, it may. They the water goes through their gills and they take the oxygen out of the water through their gills, and then we have this other ecosystem here. Now this one's kind of interesting because there's no green plants in it. Okay, let's see what's gonna, that's here. We have this other one, and there's no green plants, and so it's going to be interesting to see how these are different. Here's one that has a fish and a snail but no green plants.